I'm John Hillen. I'm on the board of directors of the Vandenberg Coalition. And uh, I'm uh, one of those commonplace Washington creatures. I'm the washed up uh, policy has been. Uh, the know-it-all washed up policy has been. And from that exalted uh, perch, I'm just going to introduce our event today and then turn it over to our discussants. So the future of conservative foreign policy, part of a series of events we've been hosting on this, I guess over a year now, Carrie, I think we've been doing this. And it's great to have a contribution. Of course, what is conservative foreign policy? How should an American conservative think about foreign policy? This is an old question. It's as old as America and, and conservatism. Great books going backwards, if you're interested, by Henry Now, Colin Duick. I think Matt Cominetti's new book on the last 100 years of the right is very good treatment of this. But our perspective is going forward, right? And by a cosmic act of symmetry, the home state of our guest tonight became ground zero for this conversation in some ways in Iowa last week, uh, especially with the line of questioning that Tucker Carlson was using with some of the Republican candidates, particularly their support for Ukraine, and then outspilled from those conversations a very traditional tension in conservative foreign policy between, uh, on the one hand, a kind of uh, muscular, leadership-oriented engagement on the world stage, uh, view, you know, perhaps you could associate with Reagan or George H.W. Bush or other presidents who have been very, uh, had a very robust approach on the world stage. Or on the other side, another venerable tradition in conservative foreign policy, a kind of Taftian tradition, you know, a tradition of restraint and uh, not going abroad in search of monsters to destroy, in the words of John Quincy Adams, uh, kind of misappropriated, but excellent quote. So there's always been these tensions in conservative foreign policy. They change. They change with the times. They change with personalities. They change with circumstance. They change with the issues at hand. Um, anybody read Walter Russell Mead's book, Special Providence? I'm looking at our younger. Good, good. Okay, everybody else needs to read it. Walter's a friend. And in fact, we were fellows together at the Council on Foreign Relations when he was writing that. And he identifies four schools of thought that have shaped American foreign policy over the past, what now, you know, coming up on 250 years. And uh, conservatives access all four schools of thought over time. We're Hamiltonians. We believe in economic strength and commerce and engagement on the world stage. But we're also Jacksonians. If we get punched in the face, we're going to get pretty belligerent. Militant will come after you. And that's also been a tradition conservatives have accessed. Uh, we can be Wilsonian sometimes, maybe do a little bit of uh, overreach, crusade a bit, try to shape and change the world, perhaps beyond our ability to do so. That's happened at points in time in American history. And then we can also access what Walter calls the Jeffersonian instinct, which is to make domestic priorities at home so important that it may make us indifferent or even hostile to foreign engagement. And that's what I sensed, having known Tucker for 25 years on a personal level, that's, I sensed some of that coming out in that dialogue. It wasn't just indifference. There was a little underlying hostility to the idea of, you, you got to tell us what this is about, how it ends, what our role is, what are the stakes. You know, good questions to ask in foreign policy. So to explore all that today, uh, we have a great guest, Senator Joni Ernst. Um, and I'm just going to read you a couple of bio lines, if you don't mind, because I think they're important. So she's a native of Red Oak, Iowa, uh, and after 23 years as a U.S. Army officer, among many other things, um, she was elected to the U.S. Senate after some notable service in the Iowa legislature. She commanded an Army National Guard unit in Operation Iraqi Freedom and uh, was decorated for distinguished service there. Uh, Senator, I believe you're the first female combat veteran ever elected to the U.S. Senate, which I think is extraordinary and, uh, and a long time coming. And also the first uh, woman at the national level elected uh, from Iowa. And then uh, coincidentally, Senator Ernst and I are both in the Army ROTC Hall of Fame. She flew in at the head of her class in 2017 in her Hall of Fame. I crept in at the bottom of the COVID class in 2020. Uh, I think they just misspelled the name and I got in on somebody else's ticket. But that's something uh, we share in common. We also share in common a deep commitment to this country and international engagement and a conservative orientation toward things, which is also part of the hallmarks of the Vandenberg Coalition. So I'm going to turn it over to Senator Ernst and our executive director, uh, Kerry Phillip-Petty, for our conversation. 
Thank you. Wonderful. First of all, thank you guys so much for, for coming. John, thank you so much for those introductions. Uh, thank you so much, Senator, for, for being here. Um, and I also want to thank King and Spaulding for this remarkable space that we're in right now. Um, so I, I, first of all, I should also thank you for your years of service, both as a veteran, but also in, in the Senate. Um, and I, I guess to start, you obviously dedicated your entire career to public service. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about why, what originally motivated you you know, both starting as an, you know, an auditor in Montgomery County, moving to the Iowa State Senate, and then, you know, obviously eventually becoming a senator and, of course, armed services in between. Right. Thank you. And thanks very much to the Vandenberg Coalition as well. Thank you, John, very, very much for the kind introduction and uh, a long history of service. But I have to say it is it's a privilege and one I don't take lightly, uh, but it, it did start with the way I was raised in rural Southwest Iowa. It's still the community that I live in today. Um, all of my family still exists between Montgomery County and Cass County and Southwest Iowa, but I was raised on a farm and just part of that hard working Midwestern ethic is to pinch in, do what's right, not only for your family, uh, contribute to the family, but then also contribute to your local community as well. I, I had a 24 total of us grad in my graduating class, and my daughter went to that same high school. All of my nephews go to that high school. My cousins went to that high school. We all probably have the same teachers. Um, so it is very much about uh, contributing to one another, and when someone falls, you help them back up. You know, and I was raised with that idea that we can take care of ourselves. We don't need government intervention to come in and say, oh, you fell. Well, we're in the government. We're going to make it better for you. Uh, so it is a, a level of resilience that I think carrying me forward. Um, but it really changed dramatically when I got into Iowa State University and uh, in between semesters of, of college, I had the, an opportunity to participate in an ag exchange that changed really the trajectory of my life. Um, but again, just going back to the way I was raised, the community that I was raised in, it really developed that, that sense of uh, duty and taking care of your community. So I, I, I need to ask, since you mentioned this program that changed the trajectory of your, of your life, what was that? You know, describe us. Describe for us what that was. When I was at Iowa State University, I was in between my freshman and sophomore year of college, and I had the opportunity to attend an agricultural exchange to Ukraine. And that was in 1989, and so it was still part of the Soviet Union. And there were 18 students from the state of Iowa that were selected to attend this exchange. And we were placed on a collective farm in Ukraine and we lived in individual homes. We had host families and we worked on the farm with our families. And the reason it changed me so much, we had been briefed before we went and I was 19 at the time, we had been briefed about the challenges in the Soviet Union. And so I understood that life wouldn't be different living on this collective farm, but you don't really understand it until you live it. You know, my family had no refrigerator. They had no running water. You know, we used the outhouse um, behind the, the hog lot. Um, we were farming by hand. Uh, they had horses and wagons that they were using. And I grew up, folks, not, my parents are high school educated. They did not go to college. Um, we come from a very humble family, humble beginnings. But still on our farm, we had running water. We had, you know, electricity 24 hours a day if we needed it. Uh, so it just really struck me the differences between two superpowers, one being the United States, where I, as a poor kid in Southwest Iowa, had lots of opportunity, and two, that they were a superpower that gave very little back to their citizens. Um, so I'll wrap it up with this and why it changed the trajectory of my life. I've always been a proud American, but 
that exchange and the first interaction we had with the entire community when they brought us all together, all of us students and, and the community to discuss agriculture, right? It was an ag exchange. This was an opportunity for the community members to speak to us as American students about Iowa agriculture. And they asked us all kinds of questions. And what, what do you believe the first question was that they asked us? Anybody? They asked us, what is it like to be an American? They didn't care about our tractors or any of that. They weren't asking us about hog production in Iowa. They wanted to know what it was like to be us and to live in the type of environment that allowed us to become whatever we wanted to be. So it was, what is it like to be an American? What is it like to be free? What is your form of government like? Explain it to us. How does that work? They were inquisitive about who we were and how we got to where we are as a nation. And again, always been a proud American, but it really made me understand that there's so many other strong nations out there that still desire to have the type of free society we do in the United States of America. And, and you've been a, a fierce advocate that if America doesn't take on that kind of leadership role, then another adversary like China will fill that position. Um, I, I want to stick to to Ukraine because I think it's remarkable that that's where you got your sort of initial interest in foreign policy. You've been supporting military aid to Ukraine, but you've also criticized the Biden administration for what you've referred to as slow walking it. Um, so what in your mind needs to be done to further support Ukraine? Well, it, absolutely. I I am all in for Ukraine. But we also have to have oversight Right. I think that's really important uh, that we are able to provide accounting for uh, the American taxpayer. They are footing the bill for this, no doubt about it. But we shouldn't be shrinking away from the world and saying, you know, here, Russia, and here, have a free for all. So I do believe that we need to be more aggressive in what we're doing as the United States. Uh, so I support Ukraine. I want to see Ukraine get what they need when they need it, not six months after they've asked for it. This administration, they will not clearly articulate what it means to win in Ukraine and what it will take to get to that point of winning. So we need to have a strategy to win. And then how will we enable the Ukrainians to reach that point? reach that objective, that clear-cut objective of winning. So uh, things like HIMARS, um, from day one, I was calling for HIMARS, you know, get those into Ukraine, the Gray Eagle, uh, the Gray Eagle drone. So they've continued to call for more of those. Um, General Atomics has said, we have plenty of those in the warehouse that we can supply. And yet this administration will not take them up on their offer to just basically hand them over to the Ukrainians. It's an older model, no worries. We already sell this drone all over the, the globe. Um, so the HIMARS, the Gray Eagles, um, the Abrams tanks, you name it, uh, fighter jets. Why are we not supplying these? Why do we not start putting them into their supply channels immediately? So all of those things, we need to enable uh, the Ukrainians or get them to the Ukrainians so they can win. And we need to do it on time. Let's not drag this out. You know, I talk about shock and awe. Remember that those of us that are gray hairs, we understand the old shock and awe, you know, of, of Desert Storm. And uh, even in early Operation Iraqi Freedom and, and Enduring Freedom, you know, we should be providing the absolute means to an end. And the Biden administration is not doing that. One of the criticisms also of, of the Biden administration, although um, uh, not from, from your position, but from others of your colleagues in, in the Senate on the American right, will say, well, why is it us? Europe should be doing more. You led a delegation to Europe, actually, right. immediately after the invasion. So mm -hmm. what do you think of that argument? What did you see in Europe, particularly in Poland, um, that you would use to address that argument? And I actually do agree in that the Europeans need to do more, but it doesn't mean we let up because 
they haven't stood up completely. Uh, so right after Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, I gathered a delegation, a bipartisan, actually a tripartisan delegation. Angus King was with us. He is an independent. Um, so a tripartisan delegation of senators. There were 10 of us. It was the largest bipartisan delegation since prior to COVID to go anywhere around the globe. So I led this delegation. I took them to Poland and Germany. And we talked to the members of our armed services that were on the ground in both Poland and Germany and got their take on, on what was happening, uh, how things were going down. And it was very eye-opening to even those that were a little skeptical about our involvement uh, with the war. So I think it was very good. It was educational. Um, and it really told the story of why we need to engage in Ukraine. And what I also believe, though, is that we do have a great number of partners uh, across Europe. We do have other partners around the globe that are assisting with the efforts in Ukraine. Um, but I also will push back. So I, you know, I see things clear cut. Uh, we need to assist with Ukraine. We are the arsenal of democracy. We have probably the best um, platforms producing munitions, producing plants in all of the globe. We can do this if we have the wherewithal to do it. We can do this. But where I agree that our European partners really need to do more is on the humanitarian aid side. My position, and it may sound kind of heartless, it's not. We, as the United States, should no longer provide dollars for humanitarian aid. We can focus on being the arsenal of democracy, and we can encourage our European partners to do more. And let me explain a little bit behind this. So USAID, you know, I, I believe in their mission, but what I see is that they're not able to accomplish their mission. We as Congress have allocated billions of dollars of humanitarian aid to go to Ukraine. That funnels through USAID at the State Department. At the time, they only had four people, four people trying to push out billions of dollars to contracts with NGOs. They weren't able to do it. So where did the money go? Where, where did that money go? It went to the United Nations. They decided we can't get it done, so we're just going to send it to the United Nations, right? Because it'll get to Ukraine, right? Six out of the eight boards or commissions that oversee humanitarian aid and other types of aid and the United Nations, six, have Russians that also determine where those dollars go. Is this a good use of U.S. taxpayer money? when we're trying to assist Ukrainians and the Russians are saying where the money can go? No. No more humanitarian aid. So for those that are on the far right, more that have that isolationist bent and want to see our taxpayer dollars used appropriately, I would argue that that's not an appropriate use of our dollars. Let's focus on winning the war. Let's focus on that. And our European partners can step up and do more with aid. You've been a really strong champion, and, and you can see why in your in your background, where you were originally motivated to serve because of your love for the American people, and then you went to Ukraine and, and understood the role that we play in the world. One of the things that you've done very well is made the domestic case for a lot of these foreign issues. And obviously, the one that comes immediately to mind is, is China. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in your 2020 book, Daughter of the Heartland, you wrote about your upbringing on a farm in rural Iowa, which you mentioned here. Um, recently, you've spoken about farms in a different way. You've spoken about the acquisition of fam farmland by the Chinese Communist Party. Yes. What is China doing, actually? Why are they doing it? And what are some of the legislative fixes that you would propose to counter it? Yes, I, I have talked a lot about this lately. And we do have the farm bill coming in front of uh, the the Congress right now, we are working on that. And one of the issues of interest, not only to Iowans, but everyone now across the United States, 
because of recent news reports about the Chinese, uh, is the foreign acquisition of farmland, and in particular, the Chinese. And we saw this a few months ago when we learned that the Chinese had acquired farmland. They purchased farmland surrounding the Grand Forks Air Force Base. Very sensitive military installation in North Dakota. Why on earth is the Chinese buying farmland in North Dakota around a military base? Okay, we need to be smart, folks. Um, they've also purchased land in Texas, also very close to military installations. This is not by half and chance, okay? It, it's, they have a reason for doing this. And we need to focus on national security concerns as well as food security concerns. So what I proposed um, in the Farm Bill is called the Farmland Act, and it is also sponsored by Debbie Stabenow, the chairwoman of our Ag Committee. And it would put a, a seat at the table when doing CFIUS or foreign investor reviews um, here in the United States, it would put a seat at the table for USDA as well as FDA because there are a number of concerns that haven't been considered when we talk about foreign investment in the United States of America. The Chinese already own 374,000 acres in the United States. In the grand scheme of things, that's not an overwhelming amount of property, but it is concerning where they are buying the property. So again, it comes down to national security, it comes down to food security, and we need to make sure that we are reviewing these purchases or proposed purchases and perhaps rejecting them if they don't meet the standards of national security. I have a, a few more questions to sort of complete this around the world that we're doing. Um, but afterwards, we're going to open it up to a Q&A with all of you. So please be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask. Um, another issue that you focused on when it comes to China um, is uh, critical minerals. Mm -hmm. You've really been drawing attention to critical minerals. I think all of us, like for the first time in our lives, understand what a critical mineral is. And I know it's, it's one of those, those new slogans that we've seen. Um, so China obviously dominates the market here. Um, they account for over 60% of global rare earth metals production and 85% of processing cap capacity. So connect that to our national security. Why does that matter to us and how can we begin to diversify our supply chain so that we're no longer dependent on these Chinese minerals? Well, it, it matters because our rare earth elements and critical minerals, they go into everything that we use, any electronics, that we have and use on a daily basis. Um, think about our phones, you know, and uh, the minerals, the rare earth elements that go into the chips, the semiconductor, the semiconductors. Um, all of that is based on these minerals, uh, these rare earth elements. And when you have China that is dictating you know, yes, we're going to export this. No, we're not. Okay, we're going to jack up the prices on, on this or that. We need to pay attention to that. Um, if you look at our military hardware and software as well, especially the hardware, there are targeting mechanisms that utilize those resources. And when we have a backlog, if it's stingers or, or other types of uh, munitions, sometimes it's just simply because we don't have enough of those critical resources to manufacture. Sometimes we have a two-year backlog because we can't get our hands on those resources. And if China is controlling that, we are sitting ducks, folks. Um, I spoke to a gentleman just about a week and a half ago that actually does have mining capacity in the United States. So he is doing mines. These are mines that have existed for a long time in California and Texas. So he says, I've still got the permitting. I can still uh, provide some of these resources. The problem is, in order to refine, I have to put all of those resources onto a boat it goes to China, where China refines and then sends back to the United States. 
It doesn't make any sense. If China says, we're not going to refine for you, what do we do? Right? We have to have an administration that is willing to allow us to do the mining here in the United States of America and the refining in the United States of America. And if not domestically, then let's turn to our partners, our friends, and see if we can work out agreements with them. When I was growing up, um, the, the biggest issue among conservative politicians was the Middle East, of course. Um, now, with the increasing consensus about China being our number one adversary, the Middle East seems to be falling behind. You have continued this focus specifically on Iran, which does still mobilize a lot of the Republican yes. use. Um, what do you think is the appropriate emphasis on the Middle East in light of this broader competition with, with China? Uh, the um, appropriate focus is going to be on Iran. Um, it really should stay on Iran. It's not a, a country that we talk about every single day. We we do tend to talk about the war in Ukraine. We talk about the pacing threat of China, which is ever persistent everywhere around us. But we know that we need stability in the Middle East. And so as we look to the Middle East and who are those partners that exist there, Israel is always our number one partner in the Middle East. In the Central Command region, it is always Israel. And they were, will always be there for us. Um, we will always be there for them. And of course, in, in order to further strengthen the Middle East, we saw the Abraham Accords. And a wonderful coalition, not, uh, not just a few partners, but a handful of partners, Israel and Arab partners in the Middle East that came together um, whether it was trade, education, uh, certainly for um, military and national security purposes, came together to push back against the threat of Iran. Okay, there is a key partner that is not yet in the Abraham Accords, and we haven't seen um, the same level of cooperation from them, but it is something we're working on, and that is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They feel the threat of Iran. Uh, we recently saw chi China come in and broker a peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, so it's an agreement that helped bring the temperature down. But my question is, why was it China? Why was it not the United States? Um, why could we have not worked with the kingdom and helped bring down some heat with Iran. I think it's really important that we don't abdicate our authority on the world stage and that we are willing to go out there and work with partners to further strengthen those that align more closely with the United States of America. I guarantee you that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia would much rather be aligned with the United States of America than with China. And yet we allowed that opportunity to filter through our fingers. Two, two more questions for me. Um, so in the Iowa State Senate, you helped balance the budget from a $900 million deficit to a $1 billion surplus. You're also now on the Armed Services Committee. Um, we're now facing a serious debt crisis. And while there was a deal negotiated, it seems to put, in some respects, defense hawks against budget hawks. As someone who I would describe as both, mm -hmm. how you. do you think about that problem? I mean, what what is the solution here? How do we avoid default, but also make sure that our military is adequately resourced to to defeat and deter China? Yes, thank you. And I like to consider myself both as well. I would say that I am a defense hawk, but I'm also a fiscal hawk. And I think it is incredibly important to understand that we can be both. And I wish more people could be both. I don't believe in providing our Department of Defense just a blank check to do whatever with. We do have to provide co congressional oversight. Um, and I love, there's a quote from Winston Churchill, and I apologize, I'm going to end up paraphrasing it. But um, Winston Churchill had once said, we're running out of money. Now we have to think. That's exactly the point we're at right now in the United States of America. We actually ran out of money a long time ago. 
we need to think and we need to prioritize. We really do. Um, so just a quick example, a couple of them actually. Um, number one, we could save $500 million today in the Department of Defense. How? Um, by no longer leasing or continuing to maintain storage facilities. We have a lot of storage facilities in the DOD that said empty every single day. We don't need them, and yet we can continue to carry them on our books. This is true across the federal government as well. We lease a lot of space, and, and Shelly Capito brought this up yesterday at our leadership press stakeout. The federal government leases a lot of office space that we don't need, we don't use. So does the DOD. Why do we do this? Um, we shouldn't do it. Um, another example is um, one that has really kind of gotten under my skin is the littoral combat ships. We have a couple different variations of littoral combat ships that the Navy did not want, did not want them. They're not survivable. But you know what? Wow, we allocated and appropriated money for littoral combat ships as Congress because they're built in certain senators' states. Need to keep the industry up and going. So we spend about $400 million per ship. Ships we didn't need, the Navy didn't want. Many of them were built five, six years ago. We're already seeing the Navy decommission them. Parochial interests will kill our military because we suck away dollars and invest them in certain programs that are not wanted nor needed by our military. And the taxpayers should be outraged when this happens. That's just two examples right there. Um, so we need to do better out there at DOD. We need to watch the dollars and we need to prioritize We've got to do better for our taxpayers. Yeah, it reminds me of a lot of the hearings that, that I've seen in, in Congress will sort of pit the, the strategist who says we need more money to defeat and deter China against the tactician who says there's a lot of waste. And my answer to that is always yes to both. You know, there's, there's <laughs> yeah. ways of doing this. So I appreciate you laying that out. Final question for me before we turn to the audience. Um, you recently um, hosted the the roast and ride in, in Iowa. There were eight presidential <laughs> candidates on the Republican ticket there. Um, what gives you hope and optimism about the future of conservative foreign policy? We've spoken about some of the areas of disagreement, but what makes you excited and optimistic? I am always excited and optimistic about the future, um, not just of our, our national security, but of our country as a whole. Uh, I... I love our country, folks. I love our country so much. We have exceptional opportunity, and, it's, and it is our, our value system that makes this possible. And a lot of people will get down, and if you watch you know, cable news, you're going to get really down. Um, but you come to Iowa, you spend time, you come out to the roast and ride, and, and you just see normal, everyday people that out there, they believe in the United States of America. They, they're they good people. And I always believe the goodness of uh, America is not from the politicians. It is from the people that we represent. And understanding we have strong people uh, st that still exist out there that believe in our nation, we are going to continue to be a great nation. When it comes to national security, um, I've had the opportunity to interact with a number of our presidential hopefuls, these um, wonderful, talented, able uh, folks that are stepping forward to throw their name in the ring, you know, to become our next president. They all have different takes on national security. Some of them that do tend to fall on, uh, on the side that might be more isolationist. I am not like that. Um, however, I, I do believe that uh, given the opportunity as we discuss different topics that maybe they would tend to see America should be on the world stage. And if we're not, somebody else is going to be there and they're not going to like it. It's going to be China, folks. Um, so we need to engage. And I have the opportunity to visit with a number of those, those people and, and help shape 
their outlook when it comes to national security. Um, so I am hopeful for our future and just understand that a lot of these candidates, we still can shape and mold the discussion as we move forward. But we also have to do that with our constituencies. They need to understand why it is important that we support Ukraine and push back against uh, Russia. They need to understand why we want to enable uh, the people of Taiwan with certain weapons platforms so they can defend themselves against China. They need to understand what it means to them in their day-to-day -day lives. Great. Thank you very much. So now we will open it up to questions from the audience. My colleague Kai is going to walk this microphone around, so I'm going to hand it to him, and then we'll go right over there. Hello, Senator. I'm Emma Ernst. Oh, no relation, but <laughs> wanted to pick up on the critical mineral topic. I've had the pleasure of working with your office on it in the past and wanted to see what your perspective of the national defense stockpile is. I know that you're passionate about the defense industrial yes. base. And so as we think about, you know, our depleted stockpile at the lowest levels since the Cold War, how should we rebuild it and what can the private investment community do to help? Thank you very much. And Emma, thank you. We we actually uh, passed last year in the NDAA our Hard Rock Act, which Senator Joe Manchin had, uh, had also co-sponsored with me. So we were the leads on that bill, and it did address the national defense stockpile. We have about 19 critical minerals that have been depleted, and this has been going on for several decades now. And we have used these stockpiles, but we have done nothing to replenish. So the idea behind the hard rock is that we, we focus on this now. Um, and start to rebuild those stockpiles uh, and sourcing those minerals, the rare earths that we would need in our defense industrial base. And this is where we really need engagement from private sector as well. If at all possible, we need that engagement and we need the ideas um, because it is going to spill over, not just from the Armed Services Committee, but it involves uh, the Environment Public Works Committee. It involves other uh, committees of jurisdiction and in talking about this and making sure that we have the appropriate regulatory reform so that if we can source them domestically, we source them domestically. If we can, then we go to our partners, our friends, and then we're not reliant upon China and other bad actors to help us replenish for our own national defense. Um, so we need that input. It needs to be continuous. It's going to take years and years to rebuild these stockpiles. But we've got a start. We just need to keep up the momentum. Thank you so much. Um, I'm George Bogdan. I'm at the Kennan Institute. I wanted to ask how you would respond to the ongoing kind of critique that's advanced that uh, supporting Ukraine and being engaged in Europe is a distraction uh, from a larger uh, struggle that's shaping up in the Indo-Pacific. Do you agree with premises of that critique? Do you disagree? And how, how would you respond? Yes, uh, a lot of people will say, if you are engaged in Ukraine, you can't be involved in uh, the Indo-Pacific. And uh, my response is that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, Okay. A lot of people have forgotten that we are the United States of America, okay? If we have the will to do it, we will do it. So the point is, though, that, and this, this is my critique of the Biden administration. So I make no bones about it. Um, I am out there slamming President Joe Biden all the time because this is a very weak leader at a very, very critical point in time. Um, I happen to believe that if we had done the right thing on the front end before a Russian invasion, there never would have been a Russian invasion. That means not pulling our special operators out of Ukraine that are engaged in training Ukrainian military. It means not pulling our embassy personnel out of Ukraine and signaling it's okay, Russia, go on in. It's not calling it a minor incursion. It is paying attention. When a dictator says they're going to invade, they are going to invade. Um, 
there were so many just missteps and bad calculations uh, that went into deci the decision-making process with how we handled Ukraine. And it was all about appeasement from the Biden administration. And we see this, whether it is trying to appease Putin by not providing the weapons platforms uh, that the Ukrainians need because we don't want to escalate. For heaven's sakes, we're in a war. You know, they're trying to fight back the, the Russians. Um, what more can escalate uh, these guys? So let's, uh, let's make sure that we don't repeat those mistakes with Taiwan. So we can enable the Ukrainians to fight the Russians. We can do that. We can also start building up Taiwan right now, today. They have purchased $19 billion worth of weapons platforms that we haven't provided yet. Let's hurry that along, folks. Um, we can do that. We need to uh, enhance trade with Taiwan, okay? More trade when Taiwan engages, more partners with Taiwan. We need to train the uh, military of Taiwan to make sure that they know what to do in case of a Chinese invasion. We can do that just as we were training the Ukrainians. And we need to make sure those transfers get there as soon as possible. So trade, train, and transfer. Okay, let's do it. We can do both and build up our, our defense stockpiles of minerals and you know, work on the budget here in Congress and make sure that we're focusing on priorities. We can do it all if we have the will to do it. Good. I'm sorry, I'm making him run everywhere, but um, let's go over here. I'm really glad that you took the time to do this today. Uh, I have to say I agree with you on just about everything that you've said so far, but I'm an Idaho farm girl, so maybe ah, just have extra sense. A um, lot of battles. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally yeah. interchangeable, Ohio, whatever. <laughs> um, in the last couple of years, we've seen some really big movements on national security, for example, AUKUS and the chips fads and so forth. I admit to having kind of a conservative bias against industrial policy, so I'm reluctant about the chips, but okay, that's done. <laughs> So my question is, we have these big things hanging out there. Is there the political will to do the necessary reforms that we need to to make those things work? So we don't have nuclear attack subs to, to give because we don't have repair facilities and we don't have shipyards. We don't have an immigration policy that permits labor to come here. There's a million Indian engineers that want to come and be good Americans, and we don't have a policy that allows for that. It takes two years for them to get a visa interview. Um, we don't have permitting reform to build anything. Is there bipartisan will to make serious movements on this? So I know that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is doing some on the export controls. Is this going to get done in a, in a way that we do not um, lose our allies, but also our own deterrent capability? Man, I was with you. I was with you until you said, is there bipartisan will? There is not bipartisan will right now. And it's not that we can't operate in a bipartisan manner. But I do think that there are many issues afoot that we just can't seem to come together on um, when it comes to really aggressive permitting reform. We've been tinkering around the edges for a very long time. And with this, and I'm, again, I'm going to point to this administration, and obviously that's a different party and believes very differently than I do. If you look at the climate agenda, they will use that as their cover for, we don't want to do any permitting reform. We don't want to do critical mineral mineral refining or rare earth element refining here in the United States. Um, we want all EVs. Um, no, all of that enables China and, and others. Uh, the climate agenda, as long as we're not doing it here, it's okay. If it's done somewhere else, we don't care. Okay. But we have to have aggressive reform there, and they won't make a move on that. They won't make a move on that. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, you mentioned the CHIPS Act. Um, so I did not support the CHIPS Act. I, I love the idea of having our own manufacturing here in the United States of America. Um, but here we are greatly subsidizing uh, these companies, and I had I had issues with that. I love the fact that we're able to move forward with that, but I wish it hadn't been done the way it was because 
it, it started as a really great idea, but more and more stuff got piled into the into it by the end when it was voted on. It was like a Christmas tree bill. Uh, I'm sure there were things that were in it that were not even related to chips manufacturing. Um, so, so great idea, probably the wrong way to go about it. Um, so that was a bipartisan bill. Um, but again, I, Joe Mears, I probably would have handled it a little bit differently. Um, and what were some of the other points that you made, Melanie? It's just, oh, immigration. Yes, okay. Uh, immigration and labor. And Iowa is a hot spot too. Probably the exact same in Idaho. We need immigration, folks. We're not growing our population in Iowa. We're holding steady, okay? We have many manufacturers in Iowa that wish to expand their operations, and yet they can't because we don't have the labor pool to do it. So we do need immigration, but it's not just for industrial type jobs. We need nurses. We need physicians. Um, how, how many doctors and lawyers going to relocate to Red Oak, Iowa? Yeah, not many. Um, we struggle. We struggle to get physicians at Montgomery County Memorial Hospital, where I received my health care. We bring them in on bills like the Conrad 30. Okay, we can apply for foreign um, individual students. They're educated, they go to men's school, and then they're obligated then to spend so many years in a rural hospital. When their years of service are done, man, they are off to Minneapolis or Los Angeles or somewhere else because they're going to make a heck of a lot more money. And we have a constant rotation of physicians if we can get them. So we need to work on issues like that. And immigration is so important. Um, the way Senator Grassley, my senior senator, will phrase this is the well has been poisoned. We have an insecure, very porous, open southern border. And the argument is if we can't secure our own border and protect our national security interests, why on earth are we going to give on a whole bunch of immigration? We've got to find some common middle ground that we can work together on to get over this, this bump or this gate in, in the road. So... Um, no easy solution there. there. There is bipartisanship. I'll say there is bipartisanship. But on issues that really matter and are going to be aggressive and make a difference, it's really hard to come together. Hi, thank you so much, Senator. Um, it's been so wonderful to hear from you, especially as a Kentuckian. And I'm just really, oh, by the way, my name is Ruthie. I'm just really <laughs> curious to hear about what role you think AI is going to play in both our strategic economic competition with China and also in improving our own defense supply chain? Mm -hmm. This is, it is going to rule the world someday. Um, AI has a totally different meaning in Iowa, uh, most likely with the pork industry and cattle industry, where and this is a different type of AI. This is, an, you all can look it up later. Uh, artificial intelligence um, is really, it, it's a big thing right now uh, in the media. The thing is, it's been a big thing for a very long time. Uh, so much of the technology that we use today already has AI capabilities. It really, people started paying attention, I think maybe more so when ChatGPT came out. And you learn that you can write papers now without really putting a lot of effort into it. Uh, but uh, AI is going to change the way we do business forever. Uh, we're not going backwards on this. Uh, we had a, a lot of um, very high-level players in the tech space that thought we should take a timeout uh, and set some guardrails uh, before we move any further with AI. Uh -uh. Um, folks, I, I understand their concerns because I, I'll tell you that while I'm excited about the opportunities with artificial intelligence, it also scares the holy bejesus out of me. Um, which means we shouldn't actually take a time out because China is never going to take a time out. And we cannot allow them to be dominant in this domain. We cannot. Um, so 
let's move forward and let's continue collaborating with the tech industry. Let's make sure we're working with our partners and allies around the globe. And let's make sure that when we are working with artificial intelligence, that there is a level of security around it. We hear about open source AI. Um, I get really concerned that uh, you can go into that type of artificial intelligence, remove guardrails, and then who knows what happens from there. So we do have a lot of discussions in Congress about this, but what are we to do as Congress about it? That's still up in the air. Um, I did have a measure in the, I believe is the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act that established the AI Commission, and that was uh, spearheaded by Bob Works and uh, Eric Schmidt. And we had some great results from that commission. A number of their recommendations have already been put into place when it comes to artificial intelligence and national security. Um, but on the private uh, side of things, we still do see such fast advancements in AI that Congress couldn't keep up. We couldn't keep up. Oh my gosh, how many years have we been trying to pass you know, pieces of legislation? <laughs> You know, tech moves so fast that what we can do is just have our general values set out there and and hope that uh, technology stays within those parameters. But we've got to as well be ready to respond. But when it comes to trade, economics, um, advancements in medical science, so much of that is going to be driven by AI and the algorithms that are developed through that. Um, so I'm terrified by it, but at, at the same time, we're, there's no going back. There's You can't put this genie back in the bottle. We're moving forward, full speed ahead. Um, and uh, we'll unfortunately have to learn as we go, at least in this initial stage. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. So we're gonna go to this side of the room right there in the middle. Yes, you. Lucky winner. <laughs> Eric Bordenkircher, UCLA. What is the conservative policy for the Iran nuclear program? The conservative position? Yes. Is, is, it re, is it reinstituting the maximum pressure? Yes. It, it would be maximum pressure and making sure that, that we actually enforce the sanctions that are in place. I think this administration has sanctioned Iran, I think, six times. They don't enforce them. Um, we should be uh, stomping Iranian oil tankers. We have sanctions on Iranian oil. And we don't intercept, period. Um, we have seen the Iranians on the other side interdict, I think, 20 oil tankers of foreign friends and allies just in this administration. So we just learned, I think it was through the Wall Street Journal earlier today or yesterday, um, they found out that there are these vessels hanging off uh, Texas waiting for their oil to be downloaded and refined. The Iranians have threatened these Texas oil refineries. They've threatened them. Um, they have active threats against former um, American uh, office holders. Uh, think Mike Pompeo, think Bolden. Um, they have active threats against American citizens. So we need to put maximum pressure on Iran. That would be the conservative position there. And I actually led a bipartisan letter when it came to the Iranian oil tankers um, and the fact that we are not interdicting them. We are allowing them. Their revenue has gone up from oil since President Biden put sanctions on their oil. Okay, it's ridiculous. Um, I led a bipartisan letter. It was me and 11 other senators. Um, Senator Blumenthal was my co-lead on that letter to the administration asking them to step it up. You know, if you have sanctions in place, you need to enforce those sanctions. This is a bipartisan issue. Um, 
The revenues to Iran have increased, which means they are funding their proxies more. When we interdict Iranian oil, um, 75% of the proceeds from that Iranian oil that we're able to take goes to restitution for the victims of terrorism, 75% of it. Um, we're not able to step up and make sure there's restitution to the victims of terrorism if we're not doing our job and interdicting their oil. So that's just, that's just one example. Um, we allow the Russians to come in and negotiate the nuclear deal with Iran. Again, what the heck, while there's an active war in Ukraine. Um, we see all kinds of bad actors stepping in because we have weak leadership here in the United States of America. We can't continue to appease. If we're going to sanction, make sure the sanctions are followed. Let's do something about it. Otherwise, they're going to continue walking all over the United States of America. Say, no, they can. It doesn't mean a thing. So we've got to get stronger when we push back against Iran. Senator Ernst, thank you so much for your for your time here. Thank you for your leadership in the Senate. Thank you to everybody for attending uh, this event. And once again, thank you to King and Spalding for their space. We really hope that you enjoyed. Um, and once again, you know, we may have weak leadership right now, but not everywhere. And you're a strong example of, of strong leadership, uh, at least in the Senate. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and thanks um, to everyone coming out today. Thank you for the space here today. And uh, I want to end on a high note, though. I do think, you know, in spite of, of everything that we see going on around the globe, you know, my reassurance to the American people would always be that we are the strongest nation on the face of the planet, and we do offer great hope to those in need. So uh, just rest assured that we will continue to be strong. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.